Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we're in the book of Mark. We continue going verse by verse through this gospel, and we come today to Mark chapter 2, verse 15. So if you can, get your Bible, open it up to the gospel of Mark chapter 2. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com and you can study the whole Bible with me there, all 66 books, all 31,000 plus verses, verse by verse, at your pace, at your convenience. And there are four series going back over 35 years for you to choose from. So you choose the series, the book of the Bible, the chapter, the section, and click and listen. And all you need to bring to the Bible, versebyverse.com, is your Bible. Check it out today and begin a study in God's Word if you have not already. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read beginning in verse 13. Mark chapter 2, 13. And he went forth again by the seaside. And all the multitudes resorted to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. I said last time, Levi, who will later become Matthew, was a tax collector despised by the Jews. He was a Jew, but he was despised for collecting taxes from them and cheating them, too, out of money. And, uh, of course, giving the tax money to Rome and pocketing the rest for himself. So... It says in 15, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Lots of bad people followed Jesus, but I can tell you this, he didn't get them to follow him by trying to be cool or by watering down God's word. He preached straight truth for those who wanted truth. And those who did followed him, and those who did not, which was the majority, of course, walked away because they loved their sin. And Jesus expects the same thing from his preachers and Bible teachers today. 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with the publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? Very difficult to find anything more sickening than the Pharisees. Very difficult. You're talking about the haughty religious rulers. That's who the Pharisees were. The haughty religious people who made up and mandated that the people follow their rules, their religious rules. And like I said, it's very difficult to find anyone more sickening than Pharisees and their type of people. Haughty religious people who follow all sorts of extra-biblical rules and look down on those who do not. And basically all that is, is making up a game with its rules and then looking down on those who would rather live in reality and live within the boundaries of Scripture then play their silly religious games. It's true. 
that the tax collectors and the sinners were bad. They were. But so were the Pharisees. In spite of their outward appearance. And of course they hated Jesus. And Jesus could wear that as a badge of honor. Because he would have been he would have been in trouble if people like the Pharisees liked him. He wasn't interested in being popular with that crowd. Like I said, Jesus taught the pure word of God. He didn't water it down, not one bit. He preached a tough, straightforward message of God's word, but he stuck to God's word. Those are the kind of people, the people who, who had a hunger for truth are the kind of people that, that followed Jesus. And those are the kind of people that he was happy to serve. Not the majority who were more interested in being self-righteous. Anyway, verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to call sinners to repent. And since all have sinned, Christ came to call all people to repentance. At some point, everyone needs to repent. At some point, every sinner needs to wake up and realize that they have offended a holy God and they need to change their ways. They need to turn from sin and humbly bow before the Savior and say, forgive me, wash away my sins, take control of my life. At some point, everyone needs to do that. If they don't, they will burn in hell forever in spite of how religion, how much, how religious they might be. Lots of people don't get that. Many people don't think that True repentance like that applies to them, like the Pharisees, who thought they were already righteous simply because they were religious. They didn't think they needed to repent. And then there were others, of course, the dregs of society who thought they were too far gone to repent. So you got, you got both of those groups. You got the, the self-righteous, prideful, religious, religious people who don't think that they need to repent. After all, they've been going to church all their life. And then you have the dregs of society who are really bad sinners by anybody's standards, outwardly, and they don't hide it, they just are what they are, thinking that they're too far gone to repent, so it doesn't even apply to them. Both are wrong. Everyone who hasn't repented needs to repent, and everyone who needs to repent can do it if they choose to. 18. And the, Pharise and the disciples of John, and of the Pharisees, let's be John the Baptist, and the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and they say to him, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? Now, in the Old Testament, God commanded people, his people, to fast one day a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement. It's the only thing in the Bible where it's mandated that you fast if you're an Israelite in the Old Testament. One day a year, the Day of Atonement. The religious leaders used to fast every Monday and Tuesday. Jesus' disciples didn't fast at all. And these religious rulers want to know why. You don't follow our protocol. And neither do your disciples. Why? You don't do like we do. Why? 19. And Jesus said to them, 
can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. In other words, Jesus says, my disciples do not fast because it won't even make any sense. The few years that the Son of God lived on earth were the best years that old, this old world has ever experienced. God was right here in a human body teaching his word like never before. People were being healed of incurable diseases like never before and like never since. Demons were being cast out. People were even being raised from the dead. Why would anyone fast with all that good stuff happening? It was a time to be happy. It was a time to appreciate what one had, not to fast. 20. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. In other words, there'll be plenty of time for the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to fast and be sad after he is crucified. The point is this, be happy when things are going well. Don't squander those good times. Enjoy them. Thank God for them. Be happy when times are good. Be sad when times are bad. But of course, honor God through good times and bad. And speaking of things that are out of place, notice what Jesus says. He illustrates it, 21. No man also sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up takes away from the old and the rent is made worse. Doesn't make sense to use a piece of new cloth, unshrunk cloth, to patch old pants. The new patch will shrink when the pants are washed and the tear will be made worse. So in that case, mixing the old with the new wouldn't make any sense, would it? And that's the point that Christ is trying to make. And he continues in verse 22, and no man puts new wine into old bottles. Else the new wine does burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. Here's another, here's another situation where mixing old and new doesn't make any sense. Wine skins um, were made out of animal skins. And of course, when, when you have a, a new animal skin, they're stretching it. So what they would do when they made wine, they would, fit, they would sew the animal skin together into a, like a leather bottle. And then they would fill it with grape juice and then tie off the top. After some time, it would begin to ferment. And as it fermented, it expanded, which was fine because there was plenty of stretch in the new wine bottles. But Jesus says, you, no one is foolish enough to take an old stretched out wine bottle and fill it with grape juice skin, tie it off because there wouldn't be any stretch left. And when the grape juice started to expand and turn into wine, it would shatter the bottles. And you destroy the wine. It doesn't make sense. By the way, Jesus drank wine, okay? He's not talking about grape juice here, friends. He's talking about wine. Now, I'm sorry if that doesn't fit your theology, but he is talking about wine. No, I'm not sorry if it doesn't fit your theology. Get your theology lined up with the Word of God. You don't have to drink wine. You don't have to drink any alcohol at all if you don't want to. And if you don't want to and you don't want to into the glory of God, that's wonderful. But don't be a Pharisee and say that no Christian should ever have a drop of alcohol. Because you're making things up. 
You're adding to the Word of God if you say that God's Word teaches that. And I know the fundamentalist, of which I am, but I'm not a fundamentalist who makes up stuff beyond what Scripture says and then tries to force those rules on people. Like the Pharisees, we just saw that. I'm not that type. I'm a fundamentalist who sticks to the written Word of God. But I know there's a lot of so-called fundamentalists who was, boy, they won't, you know, just condemn you to hell if you drink something that has any alcohol in it. Or maybe not condemn you to hell, but, boy, you sure aren't saved. Or something. I don't know. I've always just believed that it was enough to stick, stick to what God has said and not to think that I needed to add to it, especially since he says don't do it. Anyway, Jesus is making a point, you know, just don't, don't do that. Don't mix the old with the new. It doesn't make sense. Mixing old and new doesn't make sense. And that's the point that Jesus is trying to make. And the other point that Jesus try, is trying to him to make, is he is trying to make, I should say, is don't expect him to act like the religious rulers and don't expect Christianity, which he will find, found, to be like the Old Testament religion of the Jews. Because it's not going to be. There won't be any dietary laws. There won't be any special holy days. There won't be any special fast days or feast days. Or sacrifices. The whole point that Jesus is trying to make, and and this, if this goes against your theology and your core beliefs, then you're out of line. Because Jesus came to begin a new thing. You know what there's going to be? There's going to be the cross of Jesus Christ where he will die and pay for man's sins, and there will be salvation by repentance and receiving him as Lord and Savior, by faith in Christ, and there will be his followers living for him out of appreciation. The old religion certainly had its place, but it has been replaced by Jesus Christ and the cross. Churches like the Seventh-day Adventist and other so-called fundamentalists who try to mix law and faith or the Old Testament religion like the Seventh-day Adventist and the New Testament church try to mix that stuff up are making a huge mistake. It's exactly what Jesus is condemning here. 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. And his disciples began, as they went, to pluck the ears of corn. It's, talking about, it's not talking about sweet corn. It's talking about grain. Now, there were a few main roads back in those days. But most travelers went on paths that went through grain fields which had its advantages. And that's because God said if a traveler got hungry, he could pick enough grain to keep him going. And that's what the disciples were doing. God was certainly okay with that. 24. But the Pharisees said to him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? You know, the religious rulers accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath day, of breaking the Sabbath laws. The question is, whose laws are they really breaking? Well, they were not breaking God's law, that's for sure. The Jewish leaders of our Lord's day believed that there were two streams of God's word, the written word and sacred oral tradition. They taught that Moses had handed down oral traditions to the Hebrews of his day in addition to the written word of God. They believed that these oral traditions 
had been handed down from generation to generation, and they were thought by the Pharisees to have the same authority as the written word of God. That's what they thought. But they were wrong. Jesus didn't teach the oral traditions. He didn't give credence to the oral traditions. He never said keep the oral traditions. And in fact, he blasted the religious leaders on several occasions for putting those oral traditions on par with Holy Scripture. Well, the disciples were not breaking God's law here. They were not going against Holy Scripture by picking a handful of grain and eating it as they traveled, even though it was on the Sabbath day. They were not keeping the traditions. And that's why the leaders were so upset. Let them be upset. Who cares? Let them be upset. You're never going to please people like that. You're never going to be pleased. You can never please people who add to the word of God, add rules to the word of God, and say, there, you must keep them. You're never going to please people like that, nor should you want to. They are the ones who are wrong. If a church or a Christian wants to have rules and traditions beyond what the scripture says, if they want to have those things personally, that's their business. But they should not equate them with Holy Scripture, and they should not try to force others to obey them. 25, he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. So, Jesus just proves from Scripture that they are dead wrong in what they are condemning the disciples for. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, the Bible tells the story of David, who was on the run. Wicked King Saul was out to kill him. So he was on the run. He took off. And he was fleeing and he was hungry. And he came across the tabernacle, which was situated kind of out in the boondocks in those days. And he went up to the priest. He says, you got any food? And the priest says, well, no, the only food that we got is the special showbread that's reserved for the priest only in the tabernacle. David said, that's fine. Give me that. I'm starving to death. So the priest gave it to David, and David did eat it. And you know what? Technically speaking, that was breaking the letter of God's law because that showbread really was only for the priest to eat and only within the tabernacle itself could they eat it. But David had it. He ate it because he was desperate. He was starving to death, shaking. You know how that goes if you ever had that feeling. And God never, God never condemned him. David did not break a religious tradition when he ate that holy bread. He actually broke the letter of God's law. But God did not give him a whooping. He never even rebuked him for eating that bread. Nor did God rebuke the priest for giving it to David. David was hungry. He had no food except for that holy bread. So he ate that bread and it was okay because God cares more about a hungry person than he did one of his ceremonial laws. And that truly was one of his laws, but it was a ceremonial law. It was not a moral law. So the religious rulers were really out of line here for putting down the disciples who did not even break one of God's laws, but only broke one of their man-made precious traditions. And Jesus isn't going to stand for it because he always taught the word of God and he rebuked and he corrected anyone who taught something beyond what was written in scripture as if it was scripture. 
27. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath day was a gift from God to give man a rest, one day out of seven. The religious leaders of the day turned the Sabbath into a massive accumulation of burdensome, mechanical, and meaningless demands based on human traditions, which they equated with the written word of God, and Jesus wasn't going to stand for it. There's no way, because it was wrong. I mean, Jesus and the religious leaders stood toe-to-toe on this, with the Sabbath matter, many, many times. Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath. They get all ticked off and accuse him of being of the devil. It's just one thing after another. But, of course, Jesus won't flinch, and he went back down because he was defending the written word of God. Never back down from what the word of God says. That's why I teach it from Genesis through Revelation, all 31,000 plus verses, because you need to know it. I need to know it. We need to stand on it and not back down, no matter who we may offend in the process. It doesn't matter. So, here's another debate between Jesus and the religious rulers concerning the Sabbath. And I love how Jesus wraps it up in verse 28. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And he's talking to himself, about himself, I should say. And everybody knows that he's talking about himself. He has called himself the Son of Man. He has called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And of course, by by doing that, he's calling himself God. You think the religious leader is going to like that one? He didn't care. It's true. But by saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is saying that he is God. And Jesus' message to the religious rulers of his day was, your man-made rules are wrong, and you are wrong to equate them with God's word, and you are wrong to try to force them as if they have the authority of Scripture. Jesus says, you know what Jesus is saying here? I just love this. He's saying, I invented the Sabbath. I'm God. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I invented the Sabbath. I'm the one who said, work six days, rest on the seventh. I'm the one who said that. And since I invented the Sabbath, therefore I know the rules because when I invented the Sabbath, I invented the rules too. To sum up what Jesus was saying to these religious rulers, He was saying, quit giving my followers a hard time because they don't follow your man-made oral religious traditions. They don't mean anything. They're useless. They're worthless. Like everything else is compared to the Word of God. And Jesus would say the exact same thing today. In fact, that's what we are to believe and teach. That's why I'm believing it and teaching it to you right now. He would say the same thing today. There's only one stream of God's inspired word, and that's the Holy Scripture. The 66 books that make up the Bible, that's the only stream of holy scripture. Of the, that's the only stream of the word of God that there is. And so stand on the word and don't back down. If you would like to study, like I said earlier, that whole counsel of God, all 66 books, you can do that with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you have not begun a study of the entire Bible, beginning in Genesis and going all the way through Revelation, I do encourage you to do that. It's a great project. It'll change your life. Draw you closer to God than you ever thought possible. But whatever you do, study the whole Bible with me or any book of the Bible verse by verse at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry, pray for me, pray for God's word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. And I'll see you next time right here.